In applied sciences, the word vector is among the least understood and the most ambiguous that there are. Um, therefore, there cannot be a linear algebra course that does not begin with some sort of chat around uh, the meaning and the, the, the use of uh, the concept of vector. Uh, probably the best place to start from to talk about vectors is so-called elementary physics. So in elementary physics we often deal with arrows arrows to represent a certain real-life situations uh, which otherwise could not be e fully expressed by using just numbers. The arrows will um, will often, they are often being called vectors in this context, vectors. So now let's see why there is the need of an arrow to represent a, a real-life situation in, a, in the most appropriate uh, form. Consider the following situation. We have an object that is represented by a sphere in this animation on which two forces act We represent each of the two forces by an arrow. We have the blue arrow and the green arrow. Usually the length of the arrow is proportional to the strength of the force acting, the intensity of the force. Uh, therefore we see here that in particular we have that the blue force is stronger than the green one. The physical uh, situation here is influenced by both of these forces, the blue and the green, and the outcome, the effect on the ball, uh, on the red ball, is a combination of the force green and the, and the force blue. Let's assume for the moment to associate a mathematical model to this uh, physical situation, to this real-life situation, in which we can use just individual numbers, and uh, in particular we just have available a number to represent the blue force and a number to represent the green force. Okay, the, the most obvious association that we can make with a, a single number is uh, for example, we can associate the, the length of this arrow, the length of the arrows, which is a number. So let's suppose that we associate the, to the blue force uh, its length and to the green force its length. Okay? Now if we change the green force with another force, let's say, suppose that we have this new force acting on the sphere, we see that the arrow is completely different from the previous one, by e but its length is exactly the same. There is a perspectival effect here, so it's not obvious that the length is the same as the, the, the green arrow before, but it is. Therefore, we know that physically uh, the situation on the red ball completely changed from the previous one. Okay, so Since the effect on the ball is the interaction between uh, the blue and the green, and the green arrow completely changed, most likely the effect on the ball is going to be different. However, the numbers that we are associating are exactly the same as before, because the vector blue did not change at all, the, the arrow blue did not change at all, the arrow green has the same length, therefore using just individual numbers we would not be able to distinguish the situation before from uh, this new situation. And the same goes for 
again this new example where the green arrow is yet another uh, representing another force acting on the on the red ball but with the same intensity as the one before let's look at them all three together intensity as numbers associated to the green forces we would just have the same number in all three situations because the length of this vector is exactly the same and also the length of the vector blue is exactly the same therefore mathematically we would not be able to capture all the details that are encoded inside the direction where these arrows are pointing okay Okay, so for here you can see better that they, the green arrows have all the same length, but the direction completely changes. And the, the information inside the, containing the direction of the arrows cannot be recovered by just an individual number. So the direction of the arrows need a more advanced mathematical object in order to be described than just an individual number. From what we have seen in the previous animation, we understood that a simple number cannot capture all the data contained in an arrow. We need some sort of um, more general object than numbers, which are in this elementary context represented just by drawing an arrow. If we have two arrows, then the interaction of these two arrows can be represented by another arrow, and, and so on. Therefore, there are some operations that we want to retain from the numbers to the arrows. Okay, so arrows have much more, uh, contain, contain much more information than numbers but we still need to be able to perform certain operations on arrows which are commonly done on numbers. So we need to perform the following operations on arrows so the first is sum two arrows and of course get an arrow again as a result of summing. The second operation is multiply an arrow by a number, a real number. and get again an arrow as a result of this. So these are the only two operations that we are really interested in using on arrows in the context of elementary physics. Okay, there is a more advanced context, let's say advanced physics, in which, uh, well not just on physics, but in many applied sciences, there is this tool that is uh, mm, very c commonly used, it's called 
Fourier transform. Fourier transform. Now, in order to define what this, uh, we, of course, we are not going to define it in this course, but in order to define it, um, there are different objects from arrows that share something in common to arrows and what has been called vector uh, so far. So these objects are functions. are being used in a similar way Miller way two arrows So we need indeed to again sum functions and multiply functions by numbers. Okay, so one may wonder why aren't, aren't we considering also functions as vectors? Since again, the only thing we really need, okay, we need a probably a slightly richer uh, structures than just the multiplication and sum, but in particular we do need both of these, just like for arrows and vectors of before. So why are functions any different from arrows? Of course the shape of these objects are different uh, um, from arrows, but since we only need just uh, these two operations in order to, to proceed uh, and to use them, to, that is summing them up and multiplying by numbers, why don't we call them, uh, call these functions vectors as well? So the idea of mathematicians is, so formalize um, a very general notion of a set in which there are these two operations, one and two, and then at that point we just call any element of such a set a vector. Okay, so there is actually no need for a vector to be an object of any particular shape. What makes uh, some, uh, some element a vector is the ability of performing these two operations on this set. Okay, so formalize the concept of set endowed by the two operations number one and number two. So this set ended by these two operations is the notion of of vector space. elements of a vector space
are called vectors. So this implies that a vector in itself is not a specific object. A vector can be an arrow, a vector can be a function, a vector can be anything. There are ways of giving any set, any infinite set uh, of the continuous cardinality, a structure of vector space over R. So a vector can be can have the shape of anything whatsoever as long as I can take two of these objects and sum them up and get again an element of the same set or I can take one of these elements and multiply by a number so this is the approach that we will be having in these lectures starting from the next one um, in which we will give precise definitions and give this precise formalization and then find as a particular cases the vectors as uh, rep represented by arrows while we will not be talking about uh, functions as vectors which is totally out of the scope of these uh, lectures.